Hello everybody, Sanier, engineer, MBA, and investor. And in today's video, I wanna take a look at an interview between Goldman Sachs and CRISPR Therapeutic CEO, Dr. Sam. Um, and basically it's just me playing this video, right? I have this video up. It has basically 838 views um, from this Goldman Sachs channel that has about 200,000 subscribers, which basically shows you how early we are in this space, right? You take a look at this ratio to over 200,000 subscribers and you barely have 800 views after a week. And that's an institution like Goldman Sachs that speaks level of where we are at with the S-curve when it comes to technology, right? We're really at the beginning of the S-curve. As a reminder, the S-curve really, it goes slow, 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 and then you hit that critical point, that critical mass point where it becomes mainstream. And that's why we call it S-curve because it's, it's like a hockey stick, right? It just goes up, 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 up in terms of popularity and so on. And I think we're so early still. Uh, so let's take a look at this interview. Of course, this is one of our first video in the last few days. The guys have been really, really busy. I promise you guys, uh, it's not because I don't want to make videos. I want to make videos, but uh, one, there are, there is limited news, right? When you think about it, news is limited, right? You don't have infinite amount of news. Two, I think I sort of wanted to sort of step back from, you know, making daily videos. I think that got a little bit lost in the translation when it comes to like what, what this channel meant, right? Uh, so, you know, I want to give you guys information. I want to give you guys free education. I want to learn myself and, you know, what better way to learn things to teach it. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can't be making daily videos four to six minutes long. Um, and because at some point you're just going to run into some sort of wall when it comes to new information or rather when it comes to useful information, right? So. I'll play this video, guys. I'll play this video. Uh, I will take my webcam off at this point because I'll basically uh, listen in here. There's not much me for me to say, uh, but I want to play here this video. I want to go through it. Let me know in the comments, guys, um, what do you guys think about the interview? I think there's some good, good uh, gems here for, you know, of course, in a video talking about CRISPR therapeutics, specifically has an investor point of view. You got to remember Goldman Sachs. They have lots of investors, lots of people that use Goldman Sachs services. Uh, the people that are well, well, uh, wealthy, but have zero knowledge on biotech or just technology, right? Forget about biotech or genomics, just like technology, right? They're still in the oil and energy and, you know, you know, grocery store side of business, right? So um, I'm going to play this video here for you guys and let's see where we go from there. Therapeutic technologies. He joined CRISPR Therapeutics as chief business officer in the early stages of the company, and prior to that, co-led the biotech practice at McKinsey. Sam is at the forefront of an industry that's moving so fast, it sometimes feels like science fiction. We are thrilled to have you here with us today. Sam, welcome. Thank you. I want to start with the technology behind CRISPR, which more and more people have become aware of over the last several years. Uh, it was discovered by both Dr. Doudna and Dr. Charpentier, uh, your founder of CRISPR Therapeutics. Um, talk a little bit about how it was discovered, because I think it offers a unique insight into how some of the most important discoveries are made. My understanding is that they weren't looking for a gene editing technology. They were actually studying uh, how bacteria defend themselves against viruses. So can you talk a little bit about how CRISPR was discovered and how it's become adopted for its current use? Uh, happy to. It's actually one of the most fascinating stories. Um, there were two parallel efforts ongoing. Uh, Dr. Charpentier, our, our founder at CRISPR Therapeutics, was actually a microbiologist who's looking at strep throat or the strep pyogenes, which is the bacteria that causes strep throat. And <clears throat> she was looking at mechanisms by which strep throat or the strep pyogenes defends itself against phages. Meanwhile, there was a separate effort ongoing at these yogurt companies. You know, all these advanced yogurts that have probiotics, they have bacterial cultures in there. And they would create large vats of yogurt and they would go bad because the bacteria got attacked by viruses. And they were trying to figure out what's going on there. And it turned out that bacteria are not as dumb as we thought they were. Uh, some of these vats, would, the bacteria would survive, right? And what was going on is that, you know, like we're attacked by bacteria, viruses attack bacteria themselves. But some of them survive. And what they do is they take a little snippet out of the viral genome, put it in an accordion-like region in their own genome, which that's why the name CRISPR stands for regularly interspaced repeats. 
And the next time they get attacked by the bacteria, they use molecular scissors to cut the viruses and inactivate them and protect themselves. So it turns out like bacteria, which we think are dumb organisms, are actually very intelligent and have an advanced immune system of their own. And that's how Dr. Charpentier started looking at it and said, how do we then take this immune system that's in bacteria and use it in the human genome? Can we port it to cut, use the same molecular scissors to cut DNA in a, in a directed fashion in the human genome? And just like that, that became you know, this amazing tool that we'll talk about uh, that has amazing applications across medicine, food, uh, you name it. It's fascinating. There's been a lot of news recently about CRISPR, all of the diseases that it can be potentially used for. Y you mentioned the term molecular scissors. Talk a little bit more about how CRISPR technology works and how it works in the context of gene editing and, and potential treatments for diseases. Yeah, you know, our bodies uh, have about 3 billion base pairs of code in it. That forms the basis of life. You know, how do we know, how does our body, starting with one cell, know how to make eyes and ears and all these different organs? And it's all encoded in our genome. And a lot of the diseases that we know are all have molecular basis. You know, it starts with the gene. You know, there's a central dogma of life. You have the code in the DNA, which is translated into mRNA, the mRNA, same mRNA that we took vaccine shots of, that become protein and they do all the work in the body, right? And for the last several years, we've all been trying to treat diseases at the symptom level by treating proteins or what are the, are the associated molecules. Here we can go to the molecular basis of disease and say this gene is missing, hence this disease, so let's go correct that gene. Or here's a gene that's overexpressed for whatever reason, Let's delete that gene, and all of a sudden you fix the disease. So it provides a whole new way of thinking about medicine, and that's why there's so much excitement about CRISPR in, in biomolecular research or biomedical research, because you can now think about tens of diseases, if not hundreds, that can all have a potentially curative uh, therapy that acts on the basis or the fundamental aspect of the disease, that's the DNA. And so this is where the idea of a potential one and done, a lifetime cure comes from with this technology. Absolutely. When you think about the potential of CRISPR and you think about the last 50 years of innovation in biomedicine, biotechnology, how would you contextualize the importance of this technology that you and your company are working on? Yeah, happy to do that. You know, and I, I was starting to look at 50 years and I'm a bit of a history buff. Um, and I started going back further and I also trying to learn a little bit about Goldman Sachs. So it turns out Goldman Sachs was founded in 1869. Mm -hmm. That was the same time that the father of human genetics, Gregor Mendel, was doing his famous P experiment. This was a, uh, uh, Gregor Mendel was a abbot at, in a church and in his spare time, what he was trying to figure out was if I just breed these different pea shoots or different types of pea plants, what comes out? And he's very puzzled because he would take these yellow and green uh, pea shoot producing plants and every time they mated them, you always get yellow, yellow peas. And, and he was like, what's going on here? But then several generations later, you all of a sudden green peas would pop up. And so he did this massive experiment of 28,000 pea shoots and that became the basis for genetics of inheritance, how genes are coming down. And that was in the 1860s, but it took a while for us to figure all this out. You know, even by the turn of the century, uh, and I, again, I was looking at Goldman Sachs, and the big IPO that Goldman did in 1906 with Sears and Roebuck, um, you know, at that time was the first time we realized that there's something called gene in our body. The term gene was, was termed based on a variation of what Charles Darwin had coined a term called pangene when he was doing his voyage around the seas. And so the term gene was produced, which said, here's a code. But there was a lot of, you know, uh, we talk about fake news. There was a lot of fake news back then. People said, oh, you know, you know, the mother doesn't matter. It's just the father's genes that go in, and that's how the you know the child uh, inherits the father's genes. There were there were you know other theories around eugenics that were happening at the same time. But all this uh, you know uh, understanding of the genome took a while. But a hundred years ago, we learned that you know genes in its current form, and we started understanding the basis of what genes are made of. You know, the double helix, the chemical composition, and only about twenty years ago did we learn how to read the entire genome. That's when we came with the three billion base pairs or so in the human genome. But CRISPR has a profound place in that timeline, which is for the first time now, we know how to write genes. 
right? So we've known how to read genes now, and everybody assumed after the uh, you know 2002 2003 timeframe when the human genome was encoded that we're going to have a, hundreds of drugs come into the market. We're going to figure out every disease. It didn't happen, right? The fruits of genomics were delayed. And that's because we don't know how, what to do with it. We have the information that tells us that these diseases are caused by these genes, but what are we gonna do with it? And now with CRISPR, we can fundamentally rewrite the genome. Now we're not at the, you know, we're not quite at the place where we can just take a Word document and, and edit the genome entirely, right? But we can go take parts of the genome and change the code, you know, to the, to the extent that we can alter the disease and that you know, provides us possibilities that is going to reimagine medicine in my, in my view. We're going to think of medicine very differently 50 years from now because it's not going to be popping pills. We're going to do one-time procedures to change your genome and hopefully you're preventing disease or completely curing yourself of disease. And that's the promise of CRISPR, uh, which we're trying to exploit and advance today. So we've talked about the potential of the technology. I want to spend a couple minutes just on some of the risks that come with this approach. And so you've talked about CRISPR as a pair of molecular scissors, can cut DNA, can edit DNA. Some of the risks of this technology include off-target editing, maybe creating double-stranded breaks, which may over time increase a patient's risk for cancer. How have you and other people working in the field um, worked to address or mitigate some of these risks to create safer medicines for patients? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for us at CRISPR Therapeutics, patient safety is number one. I mean, absolutely. No questions asked. At the beginning of all technologies, there's always these risks that are portrayed because you don't fully understand the technology. Um, what you're doing here is, let's say you're trying to find a place in the genome that you're trying to edit, okay? And it's guided by an RNA. And RNA is also base pairs, you know, and there's four different bases in DNA, four different bases in RNA that goes to the site where you want to make the edit or the change, and then you bring the effector molecule to make the change, right? But the way I explain this is, um, this is like a 20-letter passcode. You know, if you have a five-letter passcode, odds are you're going to have, it's easier to hack or easier to, to figure out or easier to have off-target effects. But if you have a 20-letter sequence, there's a trillion combinations. The odds that you're going after a particular 20-letter sequence it happens somewhere else, the genome is very low. Now, it does happen once in a while. You know, sometimes there's 19 common bases, and the 20th is different, but that's enough to cause an off-target edit. But we've done this robust analysis, almost in an industrialized fashion, to say, let's just take 1,000 guides or 10,000 guides, characterize every one of them, and make sure there's no off-target edit. And the only change you're making in the genome is the one you want to make. Because obviously everyone's worried about what if you change something else? You know, you're trying to change uh, a cardiovascular risk, risk factor and all of a sudden you're changing your metabolic factor or something like that. You know, you don't want that. And, and I think with this industrialized approach, uh, it's going to be very reliable. And the FDA are getting very comfortable with it. You know, they're the ultimate gold standard to say what's safe, what's not safe, and what's the risk benefit profile. And so early days of CRISPR, I think the... You know, if I had come here for a talk five years ago, the talk would be about who owns the IP, what are all the risks, you know, is there going to be germline editing and all that. Now it's completely shifted. People are saying, how many medicines are we going to have in the next five years? And so that, that dialogue has shifted. And I think the companies have done their part to risk mitigate the safety issues as well. So this idea of editing a patient's genome to address disease, maybe over time prevent disease, you know, the fact that that's permanent uh, may mean that you've got to think about developing the technology and the drug differently than a lot of the medicines that we're all used to seeing and that some of us take today. Um, talk about just some of those differences because of the nature of the technology. What are they and how have you navigated them as you've been developing the programs for CRISPR therapeutics? Absolutely. I think some, well, some of the things we're doing, for instance, you know, in our trials for sickle cell and thalassemia, and we'll talk about that we have a 15-year follow-up. You know, once we change the genome or the bone marrow of the patient, we follow them for 15 years. Now, it obviously costs a lot more money and everything else, but that's our job. I think that's our uh, almost our obligation to do that, to make sure it's safe, that over the period of that time, there's no unwanted effects, for instance, right? The trials are also different. You know, the, you know in, a, in a case we're using uh, in a depression drug or something else, right? You have to study this in thousands of patients because the 
the objective measures are not there. You're, you're relying on people saying how they feel. So you know you have to do randomized control trials, double-blinded trials to say what is what is the effect really. Mm -hmm. But here, you know, you know, there's a person who has major pain crisis or you know has 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 an inability to eat fructose or digest fructose or any of the other metabolic diseases. You're giving them a medicine to fix the genome, and all of a sudden they're you know they're normal, right? Mm -hmm. So th there's a black and white effect in these patients. So you don't need large trials. Um, but at the same time, we do need to follow these patients longitudinally for a very long time to make sure there's safety and there's no unwanted effects. Okay, M makes sense. Uh, right now you're focused on genetic diseases and cancer cell therapy. When you think about where this technology is most likely to have an impact in medicine, maybe outside of those places, what else comes to mind? Yeah, I think when the technology was first elucidated, the immediate reaction was, this is perfect for rare diseases, right? Mm -hmm. There's 600 odd, you know, actually there's more than that now. We're discovering new rare diseases all the time because we sequence people, as more people do IVF and everything else. Um, you know, for these 600 rare diseases, here's how you just fix the gene. That's the cure and that's the model, right? That was the first four years of CRISPR. These pharma companies thinking this is a rare disease kind of play. But today, you know, I think the biggest impact of CRISPR is going to come in a lot of the common diseases. Look at the biggest causes of mortality, you know, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. And CRISPR has a role, and we have programs in all three of these diseases. You know, one, to prevent heart disease. Two, to make artificial pancreas that prevent diabetes if your pancreas fail. Um, and cancer, where we're unleashing immune cells, engineered immune cells, to go fight the cancers as opposed to toxic medicines that oftentimes come from chemical industries, you know. And so I think it, CRISPR is going to have a profound impact in common diseases as well. Uh, and that'll, that'll extend to almost every disease that we know. And what about if you, if you go away from medicine? Because CRISPR has got applications in a bunch of different areas. Um, how do you think about those applications? And where do you think we'll see CRISPR pop up as something that gets adopted outside of potential medicines? There's so much activity right now with CRISPR and plants and food. I just saw this, um, I saw this video of non-browning potatoes and non-browning mushrooms. Uh, and food you can store for a very long time that don't go bad because you've CRISPR'd it. Uh, interestingly, in Europe, that's still GMO. In the US, it's not considered GMO. GMO is something where you're irradiating plants and doing a forced natural selection. Here, it's a much more deterministic way. Uh, in fact, somebody had hosted a dinner that was all CRISPR edited food for the dinner. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of work by companies like DuPont and Pioneer. But the, what's interesting to me there is not just the jazz factor of it, but actually could have a major impact on sustainability. Uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation are doing work to say, how do we keep food, you know, how do we treat this hunger issue around the world? Mm -hmm. You know, that part of that is food storage. And how can we have food that doesn't go bad easily? And the other one that's really interesting that came across is, you know, in Lyme disease. You know, there's a very controversial sort of effort ongoing right now to sterilize mosquitoes. So, you know, uh, or, or bugs that, mm -hmm. that, that would uh, spread, you know, malaria or Lyme disease or whatever else. Right. And, and the way you do it is by using CRISPR, you can sterilize uh, the mos mosquitoes and release these sterile mosquitoes into the population. They did this in Brazil. And that then, when they mate with all the mosquitoes, end up sterilizing the population and to get rid of all the, the species in that population. And that's one way to you know, control malaria in parts of Brazil where there's huge swaths of malaria. And so those are all applications. Again, there's a lot of questions behind what, what should be used, what shouldn't be used. But there's, I would say for every medical application, there's 10 non-medical applications where people are starting to use CRISPR. It's just It's fascinating when you think about the breadth and depth of impact of this technology. It'll literally touch our day-to-day -day lives in, in, in ways that we probably won't even think about. You know, we'll just go to buy an apple and it'll be a noun <laughs> browning apple and maybe it'll be crispr um, I want to turn back a little bit to uh, CRISPR Therapeutics and, and some of the programs that you're working on. You've got uh, a major program in the works for a couple of blood disorders, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. Um, what's fascinating to me is, is I looked at these programs is you're not necessarily... Um, editing the specific mutation that causes the disease, but instead you're creating an edit 
that brings about a second mutation, a, compens a compensatory mutation, and it's actually something that you that you know is observed in nature. And so you're kind of taking a playbook from nature in terms of creating this potential permanent cure for disease. So talk a little bit about uh, that journey, how you figured out that this could be an interesting strategy, and, and how you've prosecuted it. Yeah, this uh, you know, there's a book coming out on on this approach for sickle cell and thalassemia. It's quite fascinating. In the 80s and 90s, people were doing these studies around sickle cell. You know, why do we have so much sickle cell in the, in the United States, for instance, or in parts of Africa? It turned out that if you had a sickle trait, you were protected against malaria. You know, you had bouts of malaria in Africa, which would wipe out entire villages, except those who had a sickle trait. And so then people with sickle trait, you know, when they married, intermarried, or whatever else, you had people with sickle cell disease, both your genes have the defect. So thalassemia is a disease where the hemoglobin is deficient, that carries oxygen. Sickle cell is a disease where the hemoglobin is defective and cause, polymerizes in a cell and causes the cells to form a sickle shape that doesn't flow in the, in the blood. Right? Then we did all this population genetics and people found, people like uh, Francis Collins at the NIH found populations or families in Saudi Arabia, Syria, uh, Greece, where they had the genetics of sickle cell disease. They had faulty hemoglobin gene, but they were completely normal. And they're wondering what's going on here. And it turns out that we're all born with an alternate form of hemoglobin called fetal hemoglobin. So when, you're the, when the fetus is in the womb, it has a form of hemoglobin that latches onto oxygen stronger than the mother's hemoglobin. So you get the oxygen transport. You know, you pull the oxygen from the mother to the fetus. And once we're born, in about six months, our body has a natural switch to turn off the fetal hemoglobin and is a place about adult hemoglobin. The evolutionary theory is when the wild animals were chasing you, you needed something that re releases oxygen faster. So you, you, know, you have adult hemoglobin that releases oxygen faster. But you could simply just turn back on, and these families that had uh, you know, these normal phenotypes, they had a naturally occurring mutation that turned back the fetal hemoglobin, which made up for the deficiency or defectiveness of the defect, you know, the adult hemoglobin. So we said, why don't we just recapitulate that using CRISPR? So instead of this canonical way of saying, let's go fix the gene that causes sickle cell disease or thalassemia, we said, let's just look at all these families and do what happened, recreate what happened to families. By the way, while we were doing all that research, it was pretty fascinating that you can literally trace history through the incidence of thalassemia and sickle cell, you know. Uh, thalassemia is called thalassemia because it's named after the, the Greek goddess of the sea, Thalassa, and because people in Greece by the waters had this mutation somehow, and they couldn't get up the hills. And so they were like not very great for the army back in the day, but there were a lot of them were part of the Greek armies of Alexander the Great. And you can trace war history based on the incidence of thalassemia. In fact, there was a little uh, conundrum of, you know, where did Alexander's army stop in India at the end? And and no one knew because there are lots of different stories. But if you look at the thalassemia population in this particular village, you know that that's where they stopped. <laughs> that's so fascinating. Uh, let's talk a little bit about just um, gene editing and ex vivo versus in vivo, uh, which is really editing cells outside of the body and then putting them back in versus doing it uh, internal to a patient. Um, you started with ex vivo, and that's kind of where you started with your initial programs. You're now taking on in vivo. Uh, tell us about just the incremental hurdles, the risks. Why is it so much harder? How have you kind of worked to make it more viable? Yeah, yeah. So I think you know uh, ex vivo, as you sa you're saying, is you're doing editing outside the body. So we take, for instance, bone marrow cells from a sickle patient edit them and put the bone marrow cells back in, right? So we can control what we're doing in our manufacturing facility, the cells we're editing, characterizing it robustly, et cetera. In vivo means we're taking the CRISPR-Cas9 medicine in a lipid nanoparticle or a virus and injecting it into the arteries or veins, and they go to the organ of interest and do the edit, right? So it's, it's a, an order of magnitude harder because one, you don't want it to go all over the body. You don't want it to go to the gonads. You want it to go to the liver if you're doing liver gene editing. You want it to go to the lungs if you're doing lung gene editing. Um, so you have to direct it to a particular organ of interest. You need to be able to deliver it in the in the right way. You know these nanoparticles are basically soapy bubbles, uh, one billionth of a meter. Okay, that's how small they are. And inside that is, is the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery. And you want it to go to the cells, go inside the cells, 
go into the nucleus and then make the edit and then disappear. So there's a lot of asking this machinery to do. Mm -hmm. But remarkably, again, I was talking about the technology cycle and how fast it's going. We've been able to do it. The first few sets of data in humans show they can edit the liver to 80, 90% eff efficiency right now with one injection. And that opens up a whole new slate of possibilities. There's so many diseases related to the liver and you can take one dose, one time, uh, and you're done. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of work on in vivo gene editing because in the future, I think that'll be a more uh, efficient or uh, facile way of editing organs or cells versus taking the cells out and doing it externally. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about the, the biotech environment. We're kind of entering a third year of correction in the markets. The biotech markets hit their all-time highs in you know, early 2021. Uh, and so here we are in 2023. Talk a little bit about how the current environment's impacted the company, what changes you've had to make, how, how you've been navigating the current correction. Uh, yeah, happy to do that. I, I, you know, you're more qualified to talk about all that than I am, and we've had many a conversation about the ups and downs of the biotech market. But, you know, for me, fundamentally, two things are important. One is the ability to underwrite risk has changed a lot. You know, if we've raised three and a half billion dollars at CRISPR, um, if I had said that 20 years ago, I want to raise three and a half billion dollars for this notional technology that I want to develop a drug, and who knows if it's going to work or not, it will laugh you out of the room. But now we have people who are very technical who are able to underwrite that risk, and you can do that now. So you know, it's gone from a cottage industry to somewhat, it's still a bit of a cottage industry, but slightly more mature industry. And mm -hmm. the second thing is, all the technologies are converging. You know, the, you know, I was working on, in lab, on delivering oligonucleotides 20 years ago, but I didn't have advanced viruses, I didn't have advanced mRNA technology, I didn't have advanced lipid nanoparticles like we do with the COVID vaccines now, back mm -hmm. then, so it was very hard to do. And so all, as the technologies converge, more possibilities emerge. So we truly are gonna have the roaring 20s of biotech, what happened, I think, from a market standpoint is people got really excited. There were like 700 companies formed, many of them subscale, without the same technology promise that something like CRISPR has. And that whole thing became inefficient. You know, half the, you know, $200 billion that's going into biotech every year is inefficient. It's going towards managing these companies as opposed to true clinical trials and technology advancement. And as a technology, you know, as we mature as an industry, I think that problem will go away. For us at CRISPR, we're, we have a very strong balance sheet um, and uh, we, we can continue aggressively investing while others are slowing down. Makes sense. Um, I'm gonna shift gears now and talk a little bit about your career and just kind of your personal trajectory uh, into your current seat as CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. Um, let's start with just how did you get into healthcare? Yeah, serendipity. Uh, so, it's, you know, I grew up. I grew up in India in a small, relatively small town, um, and uh, I never traveled out of the country. My ticket to success would have was to get into one of the IITs. It's it called Indian Institute of Technology. There's only five of them at the time, and two million people applied, and two thousand got in. And you know, I applied. I, I got in, and you're at, at 17 years old. You're asked to make a choice of your career. You, you don't. You don't have the flexibility that you do in the U.S. of saying, "I'm going to go try out different majors, different courses, and then pick what my major is going to be." You have to pick. And that's what you get. And while everybody's going into computer science, or you know, at the time, I know mechanical engineering was a big thing. Mm -hmm. I said, "You know what? Let me try this new thing. It's biotech. I don't know what it is. I'll just you know, it's complete." Uh, uh, chance I took at the time. And then I got fascinated. I was like, this is, you know, there's so much we don't understand about life, so much we don't understand about biology. And I got more and more fascinated. And I said, I want to be a you know professor and, and study this for a life. And that was my incentive to come to the US was to become a professor. And then when I came here and did my research, um, I found that there was a bit of a glass ceiling. You know, if you're trying to make an impact as a professor, it's not that easy. And you needed to learn a little bit about the business end of things. And uh, that's when I joined McKinsey uh, mm -hmm. and uh, worked with a number of biotech companies. And then obviously the choice I made to come to CRISPR was, was one where I had you know, 30 or 40 different biotech companies tried to hire me before and I kept saying no. And, and But CRISPR was a no-brainer decision. The biggest thing that can come in biotech in the last 40 years, I need to be part of it. What would you say is the hardest thing about your job? 
I, I love my job. And I like most aspects of my, <laughs> of my job, and I, I you know, uh, it's it's just great going into work every day and and you know being part of making medicines. Um, the one thing that's that is hard for most biotechs and for me as well is managing failures. You know, in a in a world where eighty percent of what you do fail. Uh, you have to keep the team, you have to, one, you have to create an environment where you're celebrating the failure. You know, what have we learned from that failure? You know, we had a drug for multiple myeloma that didn't do as well as we hoped for mm-hmm. compared to competition. We said, what do we learn from that? You know, what can we do in the next iteration of that program that's going to allow us to be better, not just better than what we had before, but the best in class? And then managing that team to make sure they're motivated to keep persisting and that, that's what gonna, it's going to take to get to a drug eventually. It's never a straight line. There's always ups and downs. But managing failure, but managing morale and motivation through that is something that's always challenging. But again, it's part of my job. Thank you, Sam, for spending time with us. Very Thank appreciate you, it.